for uh, today. Um, the one we had just before this one. If you weren't here, you missed that one. <laughs> that one is just for house guests. <laughs> so register early next time. <laughs> and so the reason why I, I wanted to talk about um, conscience and these uh, qualities that need to be developed uh, because it was really uh, for this week uh, uh, an interest in acknowledging and recognizing uh, the need for great compassion in the world today. And so many of us are uh, stepping forward within the Buddhist community to, uh, to uh, help, to comfort, um, uh, getting engaged in the dialogue but we have to be careful how we do it. You know, it's not just what we do, but how we do what we do. And so I see a lot of, of um, uh, anger. I see a lot of, of rage, uh, and with absolutely no, with absolutely no apology for it. You know, and and I'm not sure. It's something like losing our, maybe our, uh, just common, our ordinary decency, you know, and, and being able to keep ourselves gathered and collected and calm. It doesn't mean you can't say what has to be said. It doesn't mean you can't do what needs to be done. But there is a way that we can do it and maintain uh, maintain our dignity and not um, add more fuel to the, to the fire. And so it's times like these when we feel like getting up and fighting, when we, you know, feel like, like, just going whole whole hog and crushing what we see as our enemy. That's the time that we need the Dharma. That's the time that we need to look for this uh, this strength and this unordinary power to uh, sustain us. And it's when we have to really know what we uh, what we believe. We have to really know what we have confidence in. We have to really know our own proved weapons. Uh, and uh, and so in uh, working with these six uh, perfections. Uh, these six transcendences that we talked about um, today, um, earlier, I think, um, somebody rolled them off for me. You hear one? What's the first? What's the first? Generosity. Morality. Morality. And, and that's just to make sure that we're all feeling good about morality. Why do we call it virtue? Virtue doesn't seem to be, you know, it, it's a euphemism. If you can't deal with morality, let's just say virtue. Um, uh, and then, uh, okay, virtue, and what's the next one? Patience. 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 Effort. 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 Meditation. Mm-hmm. And wisdom. And not just any kind of meditation. Mm-hmm. And, and wisdom. And it takes the cultivation of these qualities to deposit us, to put us in the right place that compassion can arise and that it can be right compassion, not that which uh, mimics the original, but is but is not is not the real deal. So when uh, compassion is arising, or when we uh, we we first we need to be able to define uh, what it is, so that we know what's arising and whether it's compassion or not. So compassion, we could consider promoting an aspect of allaying suffering. You know, wanting to help, and it manifests as uh, a deep. Uh, 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 understanding of non-cruelty. Non-cruelty is the key word. So when there is uh, uh, cruelty, the antidote for cruelty is compassion. Now, cruelty can be um, actions that we take, things that we do, the ways that we uh, respond to other people's suffering, like, well, they deserved it, you know, or they should have saved their money like I did, or, you know, that's what happens to people over there who don't believe in my God, or, you know, something, something like that. But it also shows itself in, in other kinds of ways that's not quite so, so obvious. Uh, and so uh, it's looking in those deep places where it's not so obvious. I mean, you ask anybody, I don't have, I don't have a cruel bone in my body, you know, but hurt my feelings and, and I might say something that could really be a crusher for you. You know, so knowing that that propensity 
for cruelty. I mean, because that's cruelty. That's exactly what it is. You should be able to say something, and if it hurts my feelings, hey, that's my job. I need to work on that. I need to work on hurt feelings. You see? I can't, but if I turn that hurt feeling around and send it back to you, you know, to, uh, to do just what you hurt my feelings over, which is maybe make something plain, you know, or really just share your, your view of it. I feel like I can share mine. You know, and you feel like you can share yours, and if you share yours and then I, like, crush, then that, that's a cruelty streak. You see what I mean? But we may not think of it as, as cruelty. But it's designed to do something. It's designed to cut off at the knees. You know, it's a, and so we have to know where we are. And sometimes we can say, well, um, I, I do things this way, and we have this really nice reason, sounding reason for why we do it. But, it, uh, but really, the underlying energy of it is, the uh, underlying essence of it is protein. And so the Buddha asks us to look really deep. You know, you know, I say these things about myself so you can understand how you're supposed to deal with yourself. You know, um, I, I, you know I'm not calling anybody else cruel. But I want you to know how to examine, how to examine yourself, because uh, you're the only one who's gonna uh, straighten that out. You're the only one that's gonna up, uproot it. If you don't, ooh. And if not now, when? So sometimes we we think we have time to get ourselves together. <laughs> you know, fake it till you make it, and and sometimes we fake it for so long that we think we made it. Sometimes we fake it for so long, we think nobody knows, you know. But as people develop, I'm telling you, as people start waking up, it's going to be hard to fool folk. It's going to be, you know, I mean, some people come in and they, and they come and see a teacher and they have this whole persona, you know, of, of their strength, of, of their um, earnest uh, desire for the Dharma, of, you know, all of these things. But one who is practicing knows. And so sometimes they may not say anything. Some some of us don't. Some of us do. You know, just just point right to it. Uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, my teacher at one time. One of my teachers. Uh, there was this large assembly. I think there were maybe three or four thousand of us there. And. Um, uh, this guy got up and he said, Master, he said, first of all, I want to say that I believe you are truly enlightened. She said, who cares what you think? Did you have a question? You know, she said, who cares what you think? Did you have a question? You know, and you know, I don't know, it's just like that. She's just like, what? You know, I'm like, I'm scared of her. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything to her. You know, because I had only known her in a certain way. She was so sweet and she was so loving. And, you know, and, and he said this, and and I just expected her to, you know, like just acknowledge or say thank you or don't say anything or whatever. You know, but she said, who cares what you think? Did you have a question? And uh, and later when we were having our our, uh, you know, there were a few of us that were sort of like that. She would she would. Uh, draw us together for uh, deeper conversations. And uh, I sucked it up and I asked. I said, Master, you were really hard on that, that young man today. I mean, all he did was offer. It wasn't even a comment. It was just out of his, his deep admiration. She said, that just shows how much you know. It was out of his arrogance and need to be seen. You know, and so, and so that's how she dealt with it. She said, and, and he got it. You didn't. He said he understood that I was pointing directly to him. You know, he said he's my disciple, and he understood the correction. He said you just didn't get it. He said you're my disciple or what? <laughs> and after that, I stopped. I stopped challenging her on like what I thought she might be doing for somebody else. I mean, God bless the child, got his own. I just handle my own business with her. <laughs> but uh, so I apologize if sometimes I'm I'm a little little rough, but I had some crushes. That's a crush of teachers. You know, uh, uh, a lady, uh, someone said, said to me today that when she told a friend that she was coming uh, 
and that I was going to be here for a try to discourage us here. That woman was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and when she told me, like, I fell out laughing. <laughs> yeah, but, but suppose I really did get offended by that. Suppose, you know, everything somebody said about me hurt my feelings or I got offended. I'm like, I don't even know her. She doesn't even know me. Maybe she read one little thing and pulled that out and decided she knows me all together. Or maybe I have a view that's different than hers about something, a view that's different from her teacher's uh, view. You know, these things happen all the time. There was a young uh, lady who wants to come and live at the Hermitage, and she asked me to call her Bonte for permission to come. I said, uh, she's your Bonte. He, he's your Bonte. You go talk to him if you want to come. So then she calls me back, um, and she says, he said, um, don't come there because some people have left. Uh, have left there. I told him, tell me any monastery where people have come and have not left. Oh no. So, uh, uh, but what I'm saying to you is that we gotta get tough about this. You know what I get? Uh, this is uh, this is not for the thin-skinned. Actually, we have been thin-skinned because of our delusion. But as we get clearer as we get we get stronger and and our skin gets thicker and these things don't you know if you say something and and I can recognize it as a you know as a statement of truth maybe I, I should work on that you know maybe I presented myself in a way that someone misunderstood and it's not my intention to to uh, to not be understood I mean what's the point in coming somewhere to be misunderstood it is my point you know, to be understood and to represent the Dharma. Dom- sometimes things that I share in the Dharma is not my own personal opinion. Sometimes I'm still working into it myself. Yet, for me, the Dharma is king. And so I, I, I put it out there, even if I also have to work have to work on it. And so I say that to you, to stay strong in, in the Dharma in you. That's the master power in you. It's not the person that's the master, but it's the Dharma in them is the master, is the master. Uh, so, in, in looking at how we can be uh, helpful and effective in the world, we have to understand um, the antithesis of compassion, and that is cruelty. And we have to see if we have any bits of cruelty in us anywhere. We don't, I don't have cruelty for my friends. I just have it for my enemies, you know. And so, but we have to uh, recognize when that streak can arise at what point? Where's my ouch point? You know, where's where's the the uh, place where I holler, uncle? Where is the place that I strike back? And we need to always be checking and knowing where that where that space is. And 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 right there is the point of our practice. Not whatever we already are doing good. Not whatever we already understand well. Not whatever we want to like. You know. Uh, I get into a philosophical discussion about I need to look at right where I have an ouch spot. And right there is where I need to uh, just sit with it. You know, in, in uh, Chinese medicine, the whole idea of, of um, uh, the uh, the needles and, and these points on the body is like where there's a stagnation of energy. They put the needle right in there and twist and take it at and and release the pressure, opening, you know, unstagnating, unstagnating, uh, yeah, unstagnating, <laughs> you know, that that point, so that the flow, so that there is a, a smooth flow of, of energy, and so we have to go to the point, and we have to get right on it. But I'm telling you, it hurts, it it can be painful, yeah. You know? But but pain pain is not the same as suffering. Something can can uh, have an element of discomfort to it, and that discomfort can can be on a, you know like a scale of zero to to a hundred, and so it might move from just a little minor discomfort to excruciating pain to sit there and press through that stagnation, and so uh, it takes a muscle, it takes strength to be able to do that. What causes compassion to arise is uh, is really seeing, really uh, uh, in a unified way, experiencing the helplessness uh, 
of the person in that situation. Uh, and it's thinking of the other as oneself. That could have been me. That could have been my family. It could have, uh, my, uh, my family, uh, my extended family is on a, a, a reunion uh, cruise right now. They got on the ship the day before the hurricane. They're in the Caribbean. I haven't even been able to contact anybody. There's a whole slew of them. You know, but I'm not sitting here like saying, you know, I can't give y'all a talk right now because I'm trying to find out about my family. I'm trying to get, it's, it's not like that. Do I have some concern for them? I do, but I only have enough concern to stay connected with them. I can't be overly concerned. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. I don't know, I, they, I, I believe, you know, I try to contact the uh, cruise ships, but you can't get through to the cruise ships. I forgot the name of the ship that they're on. Um, I just know they were going to the Caribbean and they got the last flight into Florida to get on the boat. <laughs> I told them then y'all shouldn't go. You know, they didn't they didn't heed that. Then, you know, we paid for this trip and, and we're gonna go. I mean like at what cost sometimes you pay for something with your life. I'm like I'm just thinking. You know, but but it's their, but it's their choice, you see. So I fully accept that. So I said, you know, go be be safe, check in with me. And uh, and that's the last that's the last that I heard. So I think they might be on that cruise to, it's called cruise to nowhere that when the uh, <laughs> 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 wait, wait a minute, where's y'all sympathy and compassion? <laughs> It's called the cruise to nowhere because when they had to get the ships out of the Caribbean, you know, they people had a choice of the, uh, I don't know, helicopter or something coming in and, and, and picking them up or dropping some people off in Florida, and then the rest head out to sea. They just keep going. They don't know where they're going because they just have to see where the storm is going, and then they go, you know, further out in a different direction. So they're calling it the cruise to nowhere. And it'll and that cruise will last as long as the storms <laughs> out there, you know. So they're probably knowing my family. They're thinking, oh, we get some extra days free, <laughs> you know. <laughs> 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 you know, but I could be somebody else. I could be crying and worrying and fixating, but it's no need. I mean, if it turns out that it doesn't turn out good, then there'll be plenty of time for that if I chose to do that. But here's the thing. I have found a, a space. There's a, 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 a space that we can get into, a ground that we can get into, that we really can accept what happens in, a, in, in the course of a day, in the course of life, even when, you're, even when it's your own loved one. This is, now that's a real freedom. You understand what I mean? It's not like like knowing something is in the midst of of a battle. In the uh, when there was that that opportunity for great remorse, for great sorrow, for great pain. That's when the clarity of the Dharma comes and rescues you. You know, and you are able to look upon something with with uh, with some equanimity. You're able to accept. You know, number one, accepting the choices of others. You know, number two, accepting, you know, uh, what occurs in the course of the day. And then just figuring out what should be your response to it. So, I remember when my uh, daughter joined the motorcycle game. And I know all about that. Because I used to be in one. And I was hoping, sort of like, that she didn't, you know. Um, but she wanted, she wanted to do this. And after some years, she worked her way up, however you work your way up in a motorcycle club. Club, I'm sorry. <laughs> she, she, she corrected me. She said, Mom, it's not a gang. It's a club. Motorcycle, <laughs> <laughs> motorcycle club. I'm sorry if you ever see this. <laughs> and uh, and she was vice president. Well, in her state, the outlaws weren't there. But a couple of years ago, um, the outlaws decided they were going to move into 
her state. So what they do is they put all the clubs, not gangs, they put all the clubs on notice that they're coming in. And when they come in, it becomes their territory, you know. So the other clubs then <clears throat> become subordinate. You know, they either uh, join up with the outlaws if the outlaws want any of them. And if not, you should probably sell your bike. And so, so it was something like that. So I was, uh, she asked me, said, Mom, what do you think I should do? I said, I think you should sell your bike and get out of the club. And, uh, and I thought that's what she was going to do. But she didn't. She said, uh, oh, you have a wrong idea about, I mean, we just, all of us just have, have nice motorcycles and we go to the beach and rev them up and look at each other's bikes and we party and that's, and that's it, you know. I said, yeah, but I'm not sure. I don't know everything about the outlaws, but, you know, but I think they're outlaws. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and. But once she made that decision, you know, I didn't keep badgering her. Uh, she asked me for my opinion. I gave it to her. She didn't like that. And she's grown. You know, I had a child. She grew up. Okay, so she's grown. Um, so what I did was the next best thing. I just got a life insurance policy. <laughs> because then she's got three children. I got a life insurance policy. So if something happens and I have to take her children, I can't afford to take care of them. I can't call the song, hey, song of folk, I need y'all to help me take care of my children, my grandchildren. So that's what I did. I got a policy. So for $50 a month, I'm covered. You know, and she has, and I can accept, I can accept the choice. Now it's three years down the road, and it turns out that it was okay. Their club was so small, and they were, they were such, I don't know, duds or nerds or whatever. <laughs> the club, the outlaw didn't even want to be bothered with them. <laughs> so, but, I don't know, I might cancel the policy. Actually, what I did do, <laughs> I saved that 50 bucks a month. Um, but, well, no, what I decided to do then was to just leave it and leave it, you know, like as a trust for kids because I, I couldn't leave my grandchildren anything because I didn't have anything. Everything I had, I gave. I gave to the donor. My mother said, what kind of mother are you, you know, that you don't even leave an inheritance to your children? And she didn't understand. She didn't understand. I said, but you know, when I'm leaving the, uh, when I'm leaving the inheritance of the, of the donor, it's for my children, my children's children, and it's for everybody else's children. So I, I gave up three to inherit all the children in the world. You know, and this is how this is how we have to think. You know, and this is what gives us an assurance and a stability. You know, when we are confronting uh, issues that may uh, appear personal, remembering that we have have abandoned our our personality, we've abandoned our personal sense, and we've taken on this this um, this. Uh, uh, ascribing to us this universal quality, this uh, so everything becomes universal in its scope or in its concept or in its ideal for us. Not just my children, all children. Not just my my husband, all husbands or all significant others in the world. Not just you know like my uh, uh, prosperity in business, but all the prosperity of all endeavors. Not just my. So it's like that. So. When the Buddha ha asks us to begin uh, to uh, like expand out with the mindset of the beings in the heavenly realms, you know, and he's talking about uh, uh, the loving kindness with compassion, with uh, appreciative joy, uh, joy in the successes of others is a real thing. Joy, having joy in the successes of others means every day somebody is having a good day. It might not be me, but every day somebody is. And so on the day that I'm not, I used to call it a bad hair day, but I don't have any hair anymore. <laughs> but, but if I'm not having a good day, I can just turn my attention to someone, somewhere, someone near that I know, uh, someone, even when it's uh, a person who I feel may not uh, have my best interest at heart, may not be 
my friend. I told the story about my baker who got upset with me, thought I was firing him. I wasn't. I was hiring an additional person in case he got sick. So I wouldn't have to try to try to bake because I don't really know how. You know, run a baker and you only have one baker. You know, people get sick. People don't show up. You know, and and he he saw the ad, but he thought I was replacing him. And he erased all of my uh, uh, recipes, you know. And then the next day when we came in to bake, he got a, he has an attitude and ain't no baking going on. You know, and I was really, really upset. I know everybody's watching me now, right, because uh, it, it's um, my gluten-free bread cookie, but it's owned by Treasure Human Life Foundation, you know. So I can't be ranting and raving <laughs> and, and in there, and it's owned by Treasure Human Life. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking that here's, here's you know, and, and they were looking at me like, what's she going to do now? <laughs> you know, you know how sometimes when you like, uh, you know, people know what your 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 goal is, and they're, and they're like, just try to like prod you along, see if they can get a rise out of you. So what you gonna do now? You know, and I had to think quick. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking, give me something, something that I can turn my mind to because it's going in the wrong direction. So then I started thinking, um, he really is an excellent baker. I mean, that's why I hired him. I mean, I, I, he was he was fantastic. But that wasn't enough for the, for 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 this situation. I needed I needed more. <laughs> then I was thinking about him and his wife. I met his wife. I was like, nah, he's not that good of a of a husband. Uh, not that one. Uh, so I he talked to her. Um, then I started. Uh, but then I remembered I watched him interacting with his son, and he was a certain type of businessman, and he was a certain type of husband. But as a father. I mean, you just saw the love flowing out from him. I'm mean, like, he gets can hot and cold come out the same fountain? I mean, he was like just wonderful with this young man, you know. And I took and I dropped all of my attention right there on what a wonderful father he was. And that was the way I allayed the anger that was arising and the fear also that was arising in me. And so... That's why we talk about these things, so that when we, we, we know where to go, where our rescue remedy is um, in, in the dawn. And so with compassion, we can't really operate or function in compassion uh, when we see um, a... Um, so you, you, normally we think in terms, let's say it's in the field of social justice or or in the field of, of, of uh, uh, poverty, or, or something like that, we, we, or uh, abuse, uh, sexual abuse, or uh, we see uh, a victim, and we see a perpetrator. But the Buddha says we can't see a victim or a perpetrator. So then what, then what are we looking at? And so, so we look and we see two people caught in fault. Two people caught in, in a bad spot. So, uh, of course, our, our compassion rolls right out for the victim, you know. And then our anger rolls right up for the perpetrator. But the Buddha says you have to understand that one who, who is cruel, one who... Uh, uh, perpetrates harm on another person does so out of uh, out of deep uh, hurt and and uh, deep hardship and and the ignorance of not understanding what that is and and where it comes from and what to do about it causes a reaction that you know precipitates more harm. Uh, there was a uh, a young man and he uh, in our our, um, lived in one of our, our homes, and his, um, uh, his uh, sister was first molested by their father, and his room was right next to hers, you know, and he could hear this all the time. But after, and he was uh, young, he was six when it started, or when he became aware of what was happening, and he felt helpless 
to help her. And the years went on, and then it wasn't just the father, but it was the father and the uncle. And then as the years went on, it was the father and the uncle and the older brother. And it did something to him. And so whenever he saw, uh, he was uh, ultimately removed from the house and so was his sister and they were placed in different, uh, different places. He came to live with us. But whenever he saw uh, a, a girl like a, around his age that seemed fragile, you know, unable to take care of herself, he wanted to protect her. But something was mixed up in his head. And it started out as wanting to protect her, but it turned downright creepy, you know. Uh, he couldn't make that distinction. And through uh, the influences that were picked up, he, it got mixed up in his head. So uh, it always moved towards a, a sexual kind of, kind of thing. Now, I didn't know about it because school didn't tell me when they sent him to me. But they sent him to me knowing that I had girls too. Uh, they sent him to me knowing I had girls that had issues of molestation by their families. And when I, they started telling me, you know, he gives me the creeps. You know, he, he's always wanting to help, and he's all, but then when he starts helping, he gets too close and, you know, just these kinds of things. So I, I said, you know, I need to check him out a little bit more. And, uh, and finally, in, I found out about his story. I went up to that school and asked him, why didn't you tell me about this situation? He says, well, that's just a kind of a need to know. I said, well, if, you think, if he's living in our homes with girls, don't you think that's a time that we need to know? And, um, they said, well, it's not our policy. I said, well, I tell you what. I said, you have to come. You have to come get him. I said, I understand that he has this problem. I said, but I'm not going to be able to help him because of the way that we're, we're set up. And I said, and you should not do this to anyone. I said, if he had done anything to any one of those girls, I'd be bringing all of you up on charges. You know? And, uh, I, and then I sat down and I talked with him. And I told him why he had to go there. And he cried, he didn't, he didn't want to go, you know. But I had to wait, you understand what I mean? I had to wait and I had a certain responsibility. Yes, I had a responsibility to him, but we have to know what we can handle and what we can't handle, you know. And so they came and got him. They placed him some, someplace else. It wasn't three days before he had raped the girl in that house in that other house because they didn't have as much supervision as we have. And uh, he went to stay with like an interim family and he was uh, 18, he had just turned 18 and she was 13. And so um, we have to be able to stay balanced with our compassion so that we can see clearly what's happening uh, and that we don't get too uh, overly connected so that we can't do our job. I mean, if I fall down in the hole with the person that I'm trying to help, I'm absolutely no use to them. Cannot get them out. You know? And so we have to maintain uh, a kind of, uh, uh, when I say impersonal relationship, I don't mean uh, that we are uh, detached. It's not a detachment in that sense. But it is not an attachment. <laughs> uh, so one of the, the great dangers of the household life is attachment. That's what the boo says. It's not like making a, you know, a dig on the household. He's just simply saying, I tell you, you know, it seems like, and it can be a wonderful life of sorts, except it's a little sticky part. You know, this little sticky part this attachment. And so um, getting free, the, what the monastic life offers us is a freedom from this moment of now, freedom from this kind of attachment. 
Now, most of us, at least in this country, who go into monastic life, I mean, like we already have families. We had a husband or two or three, or we have children. We have, you know, um, and it wasn't like a lot of us were exposed to it when we were young. Or we had times of going into the monastery and experiencing this kind of life, or or it wasn't that we decided, oh, this is a life of ease. Don't be a monk if people take care of us forever, because that don't matter. that does not happen over here. Um, and so it's actually, uh, um, it's not as easy in, in this country because we don't have the history and the understanding of caring for those who, who choose to make this the primary focus in their life. Where in some other countries, it might like really be a boon. Every, every mother hopes their, their son will be, a, will be a monastic. You know, it's a great honor. And of course, the whole society respects them and, and, and takes care and takes care of them. Not the same for a woman who makes that choice, but um, that's another conversation. Uh, and so, so the greatest gift that it affords is this uh, slow, non-painful uh, development of non- Attachment. I won't say detachment, just non-attachment. So the stickiness uh, in our life that comes from close associations, you know, uh, is is uprooted. And then everybody becomes our dear sister, our dear brother, you know. And I tell you, I find that as a deeper kind of love, simply because it has no stickiness no stickiness with it. Uh, but it, it takes experiencing it to really know, to really know what it is. So we're not aloof. Don't get that idea. We are great lovers, but just without all the stickiness. <laughs> I don't mean sexual lovers. I mean, let me clarify in case there's any editing. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, lovers, uh, lovers of sentient beings, but without uh, stickiness, without imposing, you know, our will and our so we practice a life of fewness of wishes and and less and less preferences. So that you know, you can be okay being around. So you don't have to try, to, you know, do things to make us happy. A lot of times people do, but I'm just saying you don't have to, you know. Um, and uh, but what I find is that. I believe that there is a way for the householder to live in the same way. The Buddha said a monk is one inwardly. So it has to do with the quality of mind that we take on, you see, how we live in this world, whether we live as a monastic or as a lay person. You know? But it's, it's the quality of mind. So as we're thinking about Compassion, much like the other three Brahma Viharas, you know, there, there are levels and increments of growth and development, and they're built upon some things. So when I talked about loving kindness, loving being kind, and I talked about establishing virtue, because virtue is a, virtue is a, a constrainer. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, moral shame, that I'm using the word virtue right now since moral shame is like just too much over the top. But I like moral shame because it's where the rubber meets the road for me. You know, it's like I would want someone to see me in that way, in that light, in that stead. Even if I did lose my temper, you know. <clears throat> I wouldn't want it to be broadcast. I wouldn't want, I would like to have um, a chance to do it differently. But it's already out the gate. And so knowing that once it's out, it's out. This kind of, of, of um, idea arises in one when you start to feel the barometer go up. You know, you start wondering, do is this the face? 
that I want people to see? Is this is this who I want to be in the world? Where, how, where does this measure on the scale of my aspirations? And sooner, sooner, quicker, quicker, getting those uh, unbeneficial thoughts under control. And this happens little by little. You know, it happens gradually. It happens incident by incident. Sometimes it takes being embarrassed about how you handle something for it really to hit home to you that I'd rather suffer the pain of the of uh, being offended than the embarrassment of acting out. You know, I you know because I, uh, I want people to see like the well, what's our practice? You know, and so so it's little by little we develop our, our capacity. We get a little bit more thick skin. You know, if somebody calls you a name, you say, you say what? You know, uh, he calls you that name, that one that used to set me off, doesn't really set me off now. You know, I mean, calling macaroni doesn't make me macaroni. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a word. You know, and and it might be one that I, I don't give you permission to use. You know, when you're talking to me, but if you I didn't ask for my permission. If you use that, now what am I going to do with you? How am I going to respond to that? You know. And so, so we learn how to have our own response in spite of the way someone has come. And then what comes along with that is the kind of, of um, non-offense. It's sort of like a non-offense. Uh, and you find that you can you can bear more. You can you can take you can take more. But this this doesn't come by reasoning. This comes by having your members exercised by use. I mean, these uh, in the face of being insulted, learning to hold your peace. In the face of uh, being discriminated against. I remember one time we went, we stopped at a, 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 a place, um, um, uh, it was a store, we were going to, uh, we had moved to Atlanta, and we were have, arranging to have our furniture delivered until our place was ready. And, you know, I'm always telling the stories, because I'm looking back in my life before I found the Dhamma, before I discovered, you know, uh, the Buddha, before I started to practice. There were the indicators all through life. Uh, we don't have to look far to see where our ouch points are, you know. So we, we pull up to this rental place, and and we and, uh, my husband said, you stay in the car, I'll go in, and I'll, I'll rent a, uh, what you call it, <laughs> unit. And next thing I know, I could hear him outside. And, and Cadillac's a very, uh, Quiet cars, heavy duty packed, you know, so you, so so it's quiet when you're inside. He, I hear him through the doors of the storage unit place, the car with the air conditioner and the radio on. And what happened? I jumped out the car. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, he's going, you know, this is our first time moving to uh, to Georgia, and we had just passed the place where there was a sign that. That, that that said ends not allowed after dark, you know, and we weren't too far from where that sign was. I was like, he gonna get us an inch down here. So I jump out the car and I go in. And what happened was there was somebody in front of him and they got waited on. And then he came up and they said, how can I help you? And he told them how they could help me. He wanted to rent a storage bin. And the, and the lady said, okay, sir, I'll take care of you. As soon as I take care of this gentleman behind you. And he went ballistic. No. Uh, and, but I said that to say, now, that would not happen. You know, I might have a conversation about it, but you wouldn't be able to hear me outside in the car or him either because he's learned a little bit about controlling the anger, that the anger doesn't do anything. And it only breeds more more contempt. And it only further agitates one's <clears> own <throat> mind. 
I mean, being angry at somebody is like, like giving, taking poison and hoping the other person die. You know, or it's like pouring gasoline on yourself and lighting a match and hope they burn up. It's like, you know, I mean, you could be angry and they go on home. They, they, it went, it just slid right off the radar. They're not even aware maybe that you are upset. You know, they don't, nothing. It does absolutely nothing for them. But you're like burning up, burning up. People have heart attacks over it. You know, over their own, own anger. How foolish is that? And so we build upon these transcendences so that we become stable and we become mature and we become able uh, to do every, every good work. So compassion succeeds then when it helps or enables cruelty to subside. That's in its ultimate. Uh, we know that it's been successful. But what we don't know or realize is that it fails when it produces sorrow. So that is like the uh, like the near uh, the near enemy. And so we have to position ourselves right in that central space where there is not the the sorrow. So we participate in the person's situation, but we don't participate. We don't take up the suffering. And to not take up the suffering, the Buddha gives us this whole series of ways of, of looking at ourselves and saying, I am not this, no, this is not me. I mean, he just gives us, and it doesn't mean like, I'm not me, I'm not me, who am I? It's a, you know, in, in, it's in a sense, we don't have to take it that far, but like just really deconstructing this notion of this per permanent individual self in such a way that we're not so attached to the appearance of this phenomenon. That's, if we just started right there, you know, we don't have to get real deep with it. The depth will come, you know, it will come automatically. We don't have to try to dive off the high end of the diving board. No. If we could just little by little begin to deconstruct our notion of ourselves in the way that we have always known ourselves. And there comes a little space that is uh, created there. And that, that little space is just enough for us to not be overwhelmed. It's just enough for us to not be overcome. It's just enough for us to have some wiggle room that we can, can maneuver. And we can, it's just enough that we're close enough to reach and help. And yet, we're far enough from the fire that we don't get singed. And when we find this space, wherever this space is for each one of us, then we become so useful. We become so valuable. Some of the places that I go to, it would absolutely just break your heart to see how some people live or how they're treated. But if I went there like like falling all out over, you know, um, the injustice, I mean, I'd be absolutely no good to them. Not, none. But I go there with a positive attitude, lifting up their spirits. Yeah, I know it's rough. So what you going to do? You know, I mean, this is what the situation is. And so we start working around what we can do. And we start just uh, letting a person be in that situation and not overcome by it. You know, so all of the, the pity parties has no place. All, all of the, you know, the poor you, the, the poor me and you, the, it, it, serve, it doesn't serve the useful. But it's what we're used to doing. It's our human way of showing empathy. It's our, it's our human way of really being touched by another's feelings of infirmity. 
It's a natural, ordinary, human way of responding to the deep suffering of others. But he guides us to a higher way of associating, to a higher way of relating, so that we can be the strength, we can stand above the ground and grasp on, and we also don't become consumed. We don't burn up. When I take a new group uh, to me, with me, uh, like sometimes in Thailand, we, uh, you know, I mean, they sell babies for a hundred dollars. You know, and so somebody will come to uh, a monastery there, you know, and one day you just see a bubbly, bouncy baby, and they come to the monastery back and forth, then you don't see them anymore. You say, well, what happened to Sister Santa? Uh, oh, she sold. And so we start trying to find out before that happens. Well, here's the, here's the thing. My idea was, okay, so I'll just collect some money, like $10,000, we'll buy a whole bunch of babies. You know? And that was, that was my idea. Well, if they're going to sell them, I'll buy, I'll buy them, you know, just to have them and put them in the safe environment. They told me, they said, no, you can't do that. He said, because that just creates another problem. You know, that actually produces another whole market. Next thing you'll, you'll have people, you know, trying to sell their babies to you because they're so desperate for money, and then they'll accuse you of, of you know, taking their babies. So, but not only that, on the on the um, black market and the slave trade, then they'll start a whole new level of negotiation with organizations. For I said, you just can't do it, you know. And so sometimes we can't convince a mother, you know, it's oh, uh, he's going to stay with. Um, his uncle, you know, uh, in another part of, of, of Thailand, you know, something like it. But we know, we know what's happening and we try to have that conversation and we have to do the best we can. Sometimes we're successful, you know, in getting them to not, to not do that. Sometimes, you know, um, we can take a, they'll, uh, the nuns, they will take a child for a while until we, you know, we can find a placement until the mother misses the baby and decides the crisis is over. Sometimes we can help them out with whatever uh, their need is in, in the house. Um, there are different ways that we do it, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And so we have to know the limitations. That we are in a world where there is going to be suffering. And we talk about heaven on earth, but heaven is heaven, and earth is earth. Um, you know, it's a nice idea, but we live in a world on planet that there's going to be the good and the not so good. We have this whole range of minds and hearts. So if we can make it better in some way, then we should do that. But we have to have strength. We have to have fortitude. We have to have our own acts together. And so, um, oh, we end at 4? 3.30. Okay. Uh, and so I hope this weekend has been uh, useful for you. I do have to say, I tell you little stories because I want you to, to get an idea of, of um, how bad the Buddha, the Buddha's wisdom was and his far seeing. And he gave us these uh, instructions and these tips that he pointed in the direction that we could go. He told us that there are faculties that are active in us um, as ordinary human beings, and we use these faculties. But he told us that there are also other faculties that can be activated by virtue of, a, of good practice. And these can be used as well. Some of us have skills that we use in the, uh, uh, in the world that we recognize are needed skills. But well, some of us have skill, other kinds of skills that are not so um, maybe commonly um, uh, recognized or known, but we still use those skills, you know, uh, in the way that we can to help. And so I like having an opportunity. There were so many people that talked to me today. They would be afraid to 
even mention. So I take the I take the blame for mentioning some things. But you know, the Buddha talked some about uh, these kinds of, of skillfulnesses. You know, when he talked about uh, he said he talked about supernormal powers. But you know, notice of the word is normal, super normal, not supernatural, supernormal powers. I mean, it's it's just some other faculties activating and they have their own set of skillfulness. That's all That's all there is to it. And he said you don't have to talk about it, you don't have to brag about it, but no, but there are, are some that have them. But what I find in Buddhism is that they gave, because so few have them, that they're like, oh, you don't, you don't need that. It's not a matter of needing it. It's a matter of walking along a dusty road. And when you do, sometimes the dust just floats up on the top of your shoe. So you can say that these skillfulnesses are something like that. You know, they're like just on the path. And that's how you inherit it. Sometimes in this life, sometimes part in, in a previous life and that rebirth linking consciousness. So when something's happened to me as a Christian, I didn't understand by what means they were happening. Because I can only look at myself here, now, my life, my training, and what I understood and what I believed. And and some of those things didn't fit in, in anywhere in there, you know. Uh, but when I found the Dharma, you know, now I understood that there was a development of a cultivation of something along the path, and there was a ripening. And I am the benefactor of that ripening, of that effort. So it wasn't anything I did, like what, how good I am, or how you know, powerful, how developed I am. It was none of that. It was like I'm just the benefactor. And so, also in your lives, there are many things that will ripen in your life, and you're the benefactor of it. So we don't have to be proud, we don't have to think of something, because we didn't even actually work for it, we're just the benefactor of it. And we also will do good deeds, and we also will practice hard. And if we don't completely overcome, if there is any rebirth, any coming back to this world, the being that comes, who uh, who uh, receives the mind stream, the, the Gandhava, that is moving off from me or from you back in this world. There will be a ripening for any good, any good plantings that didn't ripen in your present life. There will be a ripening, and there will be the benefactor of it. So when you do good, you do good for yourself. And if there is any remainder, then that being, you know, that picks up that remainder will also give them a great and precious.